they more than us, but worried about something so you gotta deal with that's right. They're, they're literally on the front line. Oh, yes. So they're very quick to get into the EU and try to get. And they're all already there. Yeah, it's really this one also. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not just you that feel the heat on this. Of course. So, uh, just a power labor. Yeah. We're still waiting for the camera, I guess. Yes. Yeah, I will go through more or less the same as you probably read. I sent questions. Yeah, but feel free to go oh, off yeah, the uh, script. Depending on, depending yeah, because on because we you arrive early, we've got plenty of time, so we can chat whatever. We, I don't have anything else. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I want to start with uh, a brief background. Okay. Of, uh, how you became sure. the digital minister? Of course. Uh, what what what's your school background? Mm. Give me a, a summary of. Okay. I was still waiting for the camera. No, we're no, no, we're rolling. Oh, we're rolling. Okay, good. All right. So, a background of how I became the digital minister. All right. So, um, I'm Audrey Tong, and I became the digital minister on October uh, 2016. So, about two years ago. At the time, the government uh, was working on a plan called Asia Silicon Valley, and at that time, uh, there was a Kind of backlash from the people who actually have been to Silicon Valley uh, to basically telling the government that cloning or Shanghai Silicon Valley never works because SV is a very different culture. And so uh, they ask around for people who actually um, have experience working with Silicon Valley. And so I was invited to a, a few roundtables to redefine that project. And so I came up with this idea of putting a dot between Asia and Silicon Valley. So the program becomes Asia connecting to Silicon Valley. And so instead of copying Silicon Valley, we're now building ourselves as a connection between Asia and Silicon Valley. So I think that was the, the first foray uh, into this new administration. Before this administration, I served as kind of a mentor or a lecturer for the public service on how to communicate with the civil society. So I already have some you know, previous uh, relationship and trust with the career public service. But for this uh, administration, I think this discussion uh, first became uh, permanent because of the Asia SV. And after I helped them redefine it, uh, I was tasked of asking for my friends, to any friend to recommend to become digital minister. So I ask around, and people have their jobs, people have some of their reservations, and nobody really answered to the call, so I was asked, maybe giving a, a try myself. Um, so I, that wasn't my expectation, and uh, I always work with the civil society, and so I work out over a month uh, my working condition. So I don't have a contract, I have a compact uh, with the administration uh, based on voluntary association, radical transparency, and also location independence. Uh, after the Premier agreed to those three kind of conditions, then I became the digital minister that worked with the government but not for the government. Okay. And can, we, can, we, can you give me something about your background mm -hmm. from the childhood? Mm -hmm. Where do you come from? What is mm -hmm. your background in school? Sure, I, I was born in Taipei uh, in 1981. Uh, I started coding programming uh, when I was eight years old. Uh, that was when the PC uh, first came to, to Taiwan. Uh, I dropped out of junior high school uh, when I was 15 to work on uh, with the World Web and also some startups. I co-founded uh, one of the larger um, dot-com startups in Taiwan. And then after that, I joined the free software and the open source movements and uh, contributed to many computer languages, uh, most notably Perl and Haskell, and worked with Silicon Valley companies like Apple and Social Text, and also with the Oxford University Press on uh, crowd lexicography. And so after working in the Valley and in Taipei uh, over the world, uh, running hackathons over the world for about 20 years, uh, I basically just retired and uh, worked on the public good for full time. That was around 2013, 2014. And then uh, the Sunflower Movement happened and I helped the occupiers uh, to work on their communication. So the Occupy was my idea, but uh, this radical transparency really helped people to build trust uh, during the Occupy. And so I call myself a civic hacker. You said dropped out of school. You never finished school. Or what happened then? Mm -hmm. So when I was in junior high, uh, that was 1996, uh, I discovered this World Web thing. And people were putting their uh, preprint uh, papers on it. And I just wrote the researchers, and they just 
wrote to me directly, they didn't know I'm 14 years old or 15 years old, so I just started doing research uh, with the research community. So I discovered you don't have to get a university degree or to get into graduate school to do cutting edge research. All you have to do is the internet connection and some email addresses. And so I told my principal that I want to start my education on the web, and she agreed with it. She was happy that was okay, that you dropped out and, and sort of educated yourself. Well, it, it was wasn't. illegal actually, so she had to tell the Ministry of Education that I'm still there. Uh, she had to fix some records. <laughs> but uh, just a few years afterwards, uh, Taiwan started uh, the first act on experimental schooling. So today, Taiwan is Asia's leading alternative schooling uh, and education country. Uh, we can allow up to 10% of people to be self educated or alternatively uh, educated as part of our education system. And you didn't have to go back to school now and then to do tests to prove that you knew the curriculum? Not, not at all, not at all. But, but I, I did attend, of course, university and graduate school and classes whenever I feel the need. So basically I treat the college as a resource and not something to be completed. Uh, your, your position as a digital minister, is there anything that makes your position here, your work here, different mm. from from others in sort of the same position in other countries, would you say? Well, I think location independence of my three working conditions, location independence is perhaps the most uh, interesting. That means? That means I get to work anywhere. I don't have to work here. So that is my office, my usual office in Wednesdays. Uh, I have office hour so that people every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. they can just go to the Jingle Flower Market uh, and get into the Social Innovation Lab and talk to me as long as they agree for have our conversation posted online. And every other Tuesday or so I also tour around Taiwan so that people uh, everywhere in Taiwan can just meet me uh, in their own local habitat. And it's not just me, but also the 12 different ministries related to social innovation there in Taipei in the social innovation lab. So they see the local community through my eyes through telecommunication. The people there can ask them questions for the other ministries to understand what kind of interpretation is to be made of this kind of communication. So I work in a very mobile way. I don't work uh, exclusively in Taipei City, and anywhere I work uh, is still my office because most of my workspace is on an online platform. And uh, our interns, our staff can also work anywhere from the world. What if a million people in Taiwan wants to communicate with you? How do you they they just, just email me. Yeah. But you made an email? Sure. Who's going, to, who's going to respond to that? Me? Personally. But, but one million email, if you got that, would that, how long would that take? One million emails would take maybe 10 million seconds. You've got it worked out. It, it sounds as if it's impossible, but you're saying no, it's no, it's, it's possible. very easy. Um, the point here is, uh, as I said, radical transparency. If I have to, of course, uh, you know, get five identical emails and respond to them one by one, uh, like manually, that is impossible, right? But I uh, don't do it, it this way. Uh, so when I become the digital minister, uh, everybody can subscribe to my newsletter. There's about um, 1,400 subscribers. And ev everyone can ask me questions, of course, but I only answer publicly. And as soon as I answer, all the 1,000 subscribers get a copy of my answer. So there's no way that 50 people is going to ask identical questions because people see that on the public record what have already answered. And so they ask follow-up questions, of course. But it is not just for uh, emails or people asking online, but it's also for lobbyists, for journalists uh, who visit me. I insist to publish the complete recording or transcript online. So uh, while I'm sure that a million people want to ask me things, they are never identical. And because it's not identical, they also take time to process the previous context of the previous exchange. So it's one million emails, but it's not in the same thing, of course. Okay. Um, it seems as if you are sort of also a symbol now to, today uh, of this new open tolerant uh, democratic Taiwan. Yeah, radical transparency. Yeah. And, but why then is Taiwan becoming or has become so tolerant and open, in your view? Mm. I think we still remember the martial law, uh, M37, I still remember how it is like to have no speech uh, freedom, to have no freedom of assembly and of protesting and things like that. So I think as with other newly democratic countries, we still remember how it's like to have no such freedom. And unlike older republics who are more and more seeing this freedom as instrumental, uh, in Taiwan we're still seeing it as fundamental because we just got it. But there are lots of uh, countries, for instance in Europe, 
uh, in more or less the same situation, having lived under authoritarian mm -hmm. rule, yeah. and suddenly they got their freedom. Mm -hmm. But they're not where you are. I think Taiwan uh, benefits from a unique geography because uh, although we're 23 million people, uh, the island itself is kind of small. Uh, from the northmost to southmost through high speed rails, it's just an hour and a half. And so because of that, it's very easy to people have similar feelings, similar emotions. We don't suffer from, for example, a very large uh, land mass where people have very different cultural or very different uh, lifting experiences. Uh, so when we say broadband as human right, we actually mean it. Anywhere in Taiwan, if we don't have broadband, it's, it's our fault. And so because of that, we're seeing a culture uh, that could be open because people can understand each other more. And also, people don't waste uh, much time to basically uh, bridge the, the digital gap. Because as soon as we have ADSL or any other internet technology, we make sure that everywhere on Taiwan, they got access on the very same time. And because of this, there is a like gradual acceptance of uh, electronic technology, but it is not at the expense of anybody in particular. And so because that gap is not widening, and so I think that is the root of this or more open, more tolerant culture, because people feel that they have the equal opportunity for digital access and information access. But is this enough, an opportunity for digital access? I'm thinking of how the world is now becoming more and more polarized. Mm. We see it in Europe, we see it in, in my country, we see it in mm. the US, especially in the US maybe. Mm -hmm. but what about Taiwan? We don't have this polarization problem that we are suffering from. Well, I think uh, in Taiwan for many, many decades, uh, the main political polarization uh, comes from just one dominating factor, uh, which is uh, our relationship with the PRC. And I think that kind of outweighs every other potentially polarizing uh, factors. And because of that, when we're talking about social issues, environmental issues, and things like that, they're all very mild compared to the relationship with BRC. And because of that, there is actually a lot of room for this kind of consensus making technologies to work as long as it is not about uh, the you know, relationship with the PRC. What happens then? And then it becomes very divided. Um, we, we see the main elections, the main campaigns and things like that uh, roughly uh, among the lines of uh, people's different relationships or different feelings uh, with the PRC. And so, yeah, our technology, specific technology so far, we have not yet put uh, the, this relationship into the test of our consensus making technology. And I think part of the reason why this works so well is that this is kind of everything that people can feel that they have this personal stake, but without deriding the other people with different views as aliens, as people who are not human, of people who are of a lesser stature, and things like that. People are very remarkably civilized when you talk about things that are domestic, that are social or environmental, for example, about transportation, about autonomous vehicles, about things like that. People are able to treat each other in a very civil fashion. But the PRC and that, that issue of the PRC, mm -hmm. do, you, do you see ways of overcoming uh, a gap, a divide here mm -hmm. also? I mean, avoid polarization on that particular issue or, or diminish it? Well, I, I think it's becoming more and more possible for people to talk about specific issues. Uh, and now that at the end of this year we're going to have referendums, uh, this becomes one of the main venues that people uh, voice their concerns and also try to define um, their um, ideal identity for Taiwan through the test of referendums as we see elsewhere. Previously, we don't have a really working referendum system. And so while people also want to you know, use this kind of uh, issues to test the referendum system, because the referendum uh, um, threshold is kind of high, uh, it wasn't very successful. Do you see referendums as, as a good way of, of finding out where opinions and, and how to uh, legislate and how to find compromise, or how do you see the referendum? Well, we designed the Referendum Act so that it put a lot of emphasis on uh, dialogue and on uh, public communication and debate 
preceding the referendum. So each referendum has to have uh, like I think it's five uh, different uh, debates on various regions in Taiwan. They have to be live streamed. They have to be accessible online and things like that. So I think um, at least it enables a possibility for a substantial discussion about that issue before uh, people actually go to the, the voting booth. But on the other hand, this is the first time we're actually doing it, so I, I can't say whether it's more effective or less effective because it's literally the first time. Uh, we talk a lot uh, in Sweden and I think uh, in, in Europe States about social media today sure. and, and what does it do to us, mm -hmm. to our society, to mm -hmm. us as individuals and many means that it, it, it brings about polarization, mm -hmm. uh, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook and all mm -hmm. that. How do you see social media? Well, you just mentioned three very different spaces and it's very <laughs> difficult to, to find a generalization uh, that talks to all of them. Um, I think personally, because I work on social interaction design and on mobile productivity tools in social text, which very much resembles uh, Twitter and Facebook, um, I always think that it is um, based on how people expect out of it. If people expect it as a way for people to connect in real space, in face-to-face, -face. so it's a way to discover people with similar interests, so you can discover um, that you're not alone in caring about a social environmental issue, and it helps you to maybe organize some events together and for people to eventually meet. Then I think that is a very good use of social media and internet because then people never feel alone. On the other hand, if it is working as a substitute uh, for face-to-face uh, -face communication and for real world gathering, then people tend to put a lot of projection on each other's profiles, on each other's text, because there is no higher bandwidth communication to fill in the gaps. So people just put their projection to it. And I think that is kind of dangerous, because then uh, there is nothing for the projection to be based on, and it creates a lot of opportunities that for the messages, as you said, the polarizations to, to work with, because um, there was no solid understanding of each other as people, uh, and just you know as carriers of messages. But you're talking now about the expectations that people have on social That's media. That's exactly right. Yeah, but but doesn't it, doesn't social media also create these expectations or influence us in a certain way so that maybe we have we have negative expectations or expectations that are based only on on. on but that is true for all media. It is not particular to social media, right? This is a very old idea about media literacy. Uh, if you see a printed paper and assume everything that's printed there was true, then uh, it is not a very good case of media literacy, which is why in our K-12 curriculum, uh, we basically position uh, starting next year teachers not as an authoritarian uh, source of truth, but rather just a learner that learns along with the students and finds the information they have on the internet and also work on critical thinking and things like that. Because previously, during the authoritarian era, if things are printed in a certain font, spoken in a certain voice, then it's taken as the standard uh, answer. And a lot of uh, media, not just social media, kind of piggyback on this kind of vector uh, in, in people's mind uh, to basically um, gain legitimacy without having uh, the accountability to, to go with it. And people's expectation from the source of the truth or the source of the news, if it's a more authoritarian, then regardless of whether it's social media or traditional media, there's a lot of room for, for the disinformation to, to spread. But if people learn critical thinking from a very young age, then we have pretty solid evidence that regardless of its traditional or social media, they will be able to think for themselves. Have you found uh, your own way, or, or Taiwan's way, or a positive way mm -hmm. of using social media? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I've been understanding yes. anyway. Tell me. Right, so um, I think in Taiwan, people generally feel that um, there's a certain space for public discourse. There's certain space for people and family to catch up. And we very rarely kind of confuse uh, those two places together. Uh, and I think it is true that people use instant messaging, people use Facebook and things like that, but we don't think that they are the place to have binding discussions on public issues. So for example, we have a dedicated platform uh, for e-petition, for um, regulation, 
uh, pre-announcements for uh, participatory budgeting and also for a visualization of budgeting. And it's called a join platform at join.gov.tw. And of the 23 million people in Taiwan, about 5 million uh, people use it. And people understand that if you're going to have a binding discussion on your city government, on the national government, that is going to happen on a domain that ends with gov.tw. And so, so it's join.gov.tw, where you can see literally all the different uh, ministries, all the hundred, uh, actually 1,300 of their uh, ministerial projects, how their budgets are allocated, and you can drill down to each one of it to leave a discussion and have a real conversation with career public service. And because of these uh, spaces and also e-petitions and so on, people gradually learn that if you're going to talk in a public sphere, there is a space conducted for public discussion. And if you're going to catch up with your friend, friend and family, of course, well, there's social media for catching up with friend and family, but we don't confuse the two together. What do you achieve then with this? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, efforts make, uh, to make the citizens more confident in how responsive and how accountable that the government is doing. Because we're not just cherry-picking a few projects to publish the budget. We're not just cherry-picking a few regulations to have a consultation. It's every single budget item. It's every single regulation. And so because of this, uh, I think the citizens generally have a baseline understanding of how exactly the public service works. And also they expect the public career public service to have a real discussion without them having to go through a representative from the legislature or things like that. So and the effect is that they uh, are ready to accept more or compromise more? Or not, not at all. Uh, I'm just saying that they have more confidence of their status as citizens, of people who have a right to um, ask the government to provide account for policy making. And also it provides the career public service uh, more room, more space, because instead of answering you know, 50 identical emails one by one, there is one canonical URL for all the different uh, government projects. And th so they don't have to explain the same thing over and again, because people understand that for each budget item, for each regulation, for each petition, there is a graph of all the spendings, all the procurements, all the month by month or quarter by quarter activities. And if people ask questions, they expect that people, uh, the career public service, just answer in real time. I wrote down one question. Um, uh, I don't know if it's a, it's a accurate understanding, no, of, uh, but uh, I, I wrote, explain the, your process for solving conflicts and creating laws that most people sign on to. Sure. So uh, for controversial issues uh, that's related to digital economy or people's surface uh, through e-petition, we usually go through a consultation process that is modeled from a Canadian methodology called Focus Conversation Method. And it's four steps. It's facts, feelings, ideas, and decisions. On the fact stage, for example, when Uber first came to Taiwan and started engaging with people with their professional driver's license, we first asked people to contribute the evidence that they have about the number of vehicles, timelines of Ubers coming to Taiwan, and things like that. So we establish throughout the stakeholder communication the very set of basic facts that everybody can agree on. And even the wording of the issue at hand, we eventually settled on people without professional driver's license uh, picking up passengers and charging them for it. So it's like absolutely neutral way of stating a simple fact that it's happening. And then we ask people's feelings about the facts. You can feel happy, you can feel angry, it's all okay. So we leave like a month or so for people just to check with each other's feelings and design with AI powered conversations for the resonating feelings to be surfaced and the polarizing feelings to be acknowledged. And then we start ideation and using design thinking methodologies, we work with stakeholders to identify which of their possible solutions correspond to the things that can take care of the most people's feelings. And finally, we turn them into law. And so for the feeling part, uh, we use AI power of conversation 
so that people can see where they stand among their social media friends and families, just by clicking agree or disagree on each other's feelings. And so every time we run this uh, over three weeks or four weeks, we'll always see that people respect each other's divisive statements, but focus far more time on the statements that are consensus. And that is because there is no reply button. You cannot attack each other if there is no reply button. If you see a few feelings you don't agree, where you write something else, do you think people can resonate more? And so people kind of compete, but for resonance, for things that they think everybody can feel the same way. And once we get those feelings, then we check with those stakeholders and make sure that they come up with coherent ideas that take care of those feelings one by one. And so this is a way that basically we don't confuse the feelings and the ideas stage. We make sure that people's feelings are properly acknowledged before moving on to ideation. And these are different taxi companies. That that, that's right, and we're yeah. serving unions, and we live stream these consultation meetings so that people who uh, set the agenda, we only use the consensus items and nothing more as the agenda for this kind of consultation uh, with stakeholders. And because it's live stream, when Uber agreed, saying, you know, we will work with our drivers to help them obtain professional driver's license, they cannot take it back their position because it's live stream, they're, they're bound to their wits. And so because of that, when we did the regulation, everybody saw it coming. And so, which is why you can call a taxi now from Uber app in Taiwan. And taxi companies are also rolling out their Uber-like services. So they're all on the same platform, all on the same conditions, the, working on the same conditions. They're, they're competing fairly. Yeah. And then everybody's happy, also the old companies. Well, happy. everybody can live with that. And I wouldn't say everybody's very happy, but at least people can live with that. And that's the important part, because people don't feel that they're being sacrificed because they don't have the right connection with to the minister, or things like that, because it's really open, multi-stakeholder consultation. Mm -hmm. And they agree on, on the rules. They agree on the basic principles, because if they don't show up, or they go against the people's consensus feelings, then well, they they become the villain of the story, and because people don't want to be that, right? So they come up with a set of ideas they can all kind of compromise on. So it's then being constructed, they're being constructed. That's right. Uh, you also uh, talked about the virus of the mind, which is a title mm -hmm. of a famous book. Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, and and you mentioned Uber as uh, when when they came in, it was a virus of the mind. That's right. How, what do you mean that? What do you mean by that? So uh, I mean it as something that spreads. Right, uh, from one mind to another. At the time, they were uh, banking on this term called sharing economy, which means very different thing to different people. But for Uber at that time in 2015, it meant code dispatch cars better than loss. So we just follow code, not loss. That's the, the payload. Uh, and it can spread from a driver to some passengers uh, to install the app and to more drivers, to more passengers. And maybe someone become a driver for Uber for a couple of weeks, discover it's not a very good deal, uh, and just, just quit uh, because there's no insurance and things like that at the time. But still, during that course of a few weeks, they will have already have infected other people with, with, with this virus of the mind. So it's, it's a kind of, kind of an epidemic uh, situation where people generally uh, feel maybe not like that after uh, actually driven for Uber for a few weeks, but during that time they already have infected more people. And because of that, we, we don't negotiate with uh, epidemic because it's not, you don't negotiate with the flu, it's not the same category, so no, you can't. So what we're saying is after you feel deeply and listen deeply to each other's feelings, people become immune to those polarized uh, ideas. Uh, people become uh, capable of thinking through empathy of how other people think about this. But is it, is it, would it be correct to say that the virus of the mind is sort of an idea that at first seems so clever, so smart, so natural, it's above the law even. I mean, yeah, it it's, a, it, it's a meme, basically. It's a meme that, that's attractive, that you would want to spread it, uh, regardless of whether it's actually factual. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How much of an example to the world would Taiwan be mm -hmm. as this open tolerant democracy? Well, yeah, I, I think uh, Taiwan is definitely, at least in Asia, we're the most open civil society. If you look at the Civicus Monitor, for example, that measures the freedom of assembly, expression, and so on, um, Taiwan is definitely the only one that is uh, completely open. And so I think we serve as a kind of existential proof that you can be this open in a civil society, that you can work with civil society as partners, that the government doesn't have to dominate policy making, and the democracy still works pretty well.
and these achievements, how is it seen in China? Well, I think the PRC at the moment uh, is looking at Taiwan and the kind of civic technologies we're, we're uh, developing. Um, many people in PRC, maybe they don't call them civic hackers for obvious reasons, but they still work on, for example, social enterprises, or for example, they still work on participatory budgeting on a smaller scale level and things like that. So generally, I think the technologies uh, we develop are what we call appropriate technologies, meaning that it fits whatever the social environment that they're uh, working with. Uh, this is certainly not something that we patent or you have to subscribe to Taiwan or to, to you know, pay yearly license fees or, or whatever like that. So for bits and pieces, we're also seeing a lot of adoption in even authoritarian environments that don't have a, a good connection to, to the global internet. Still, these technologies can work in this context and even in intranet, like within a company, within a nonprofit as well. So we're seeing pretty uh, good adoption in even authoritarian uh, areas, and that uh, includes PRC. So they're picking up on some of your ideas here. That's right. Yeah. You were mentioning it as a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. Explain. Sure. A social enterprise is basically a, a group with a mission, a purpose, to make the world better, socially or um, you know, environmentally. And driven by this purpose, they offer services or products uh, with the market and through trading with the market, they realize their impact, and through doing business, solve those environmental or social issues. Any example? Sure. Um, in Taiwan, we've got like 20 years of social enterprises uh, before actually the term social enterprise gets imported uh, from the UK. Uh, and so, for example, the Homemakers Union Consumers Co-op, they've been around for more than 20 years. It's a co-op of homemakers who uh, basically collaborate to purchase uh, agricultural products that are friendly to the environment. And just by uniting the consumers' uh, efforts together, they were able to charter certain uh, farmlands and things like that and convince the agricultural workers to work in a way that is sustainable uh, to the land. Or for example, the Children R.S. Foundation, they're a nonprofit who work with people with Down syndrome, for example. And I sh just show you actually my office in the Social Innovation Lab. And actually that Social Innovation Lab's uh, office, there's the soccer field that is drawn by people with Down syndrome. So the Children R.S. Foundation work with people with uh, different mental development and basically uh, discovered that they have uh, talents for art. They have talents for maybe bakery. They have talents for a lot of uh, things that you wouldn't think that they have talents for and develop them into a responsible partner in the society instead of just people feeling that they're vulnerable people to be taken care of. And so I think uh, the more business they make through battery, bakery or through design or through whatever, uh, the more people they would be able to employ with Down syndrome and other mental developments. And so that is also a classic uh, social enterprise. And self-confidence crisis. And, uh, That's right. Uh, yeah. All the positive benefits. That's exactly right. So they, so these examples, they do business, but as part of their business, they make the environment or the society better. For themselves. For themselves. Mm -hmm. um, someone said to me before going to Taiwan that that democracy, open, tolerant society, that's mm -hmm. our best defense against um, PRC. Mm -hmm. and, and their ambitions to take in mm -hmm. the top of education. Uh, what, 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 what do your friend mean by that? Uh, that? That there is a threat, I guess. That mm -hmm. there is a worry that, mm -hmm. the, that the giant across the strait mm -hmm. will swallow you one day. Mm -hmm. I guess it seems to be the ambition we, we hear a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but the open democratic society, the more open, the more democratic Taiwan becomes, mm -hmm. the, the better our defense against mm. such an ambition? I wouldn't think of it as a defense. I mean, it's clearly different models uh, that we're experimenting. And just like all experimentations, uh, if it works out pretty well, our model also has the possibility of you know, spreading and also influencing uh, our nearby regions, which are maybe allured at this moment by authoritarian uh, models because they think it's more efficient or whatever. Uh, but because in Taiwan, we think about efficiency 
in terms of triple bottom line. Like it has to be effective for the society, for the environment, and for economy, and not just you know for one and sacrificing the, the other two. And so as more and more people see that it's only through an open, tolerant democracy can we actually deliver innovations that work for everyone and leave no externalities right, uh, to other domains of the society or the environment. I think that idea can catch on and also people can look to Taiwan uh, for possible ways of delivering such social innovations in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion and not a top-down fashion. So we're, I don't think we're playing defensive, I think we're experimenting. And if the experiments that are successful, the fruit of our experiment is widely accessible to the entire uh, you know, society that is part of um, either this region or anywhere in the world, really. So instead of defense, weapon? What is it? It's weapons, tools, right? If you, if you saw um, the, the arrival, uh, <laughs> there, there's a movie uh, about, um, you know, people think weapons, but they actually just mean tools. Uh, so, uh, virus of the mind? Yes. Could it be the virus of the mind? Mm. It's open, tolerant society. Mm. More people, more countries, states will see the benefits of it and mm. spreads like a virus of the mind. Well, I, I think it's it's like a uh, inoculation, right? <laughs> um, it is inoculation against uh, merits of the mind um, by perhaps developing a better tolerance, a better diversity. Because this really is the idea of biodiversity. If you have a society that is more diverse, that allows people coming from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures to uh, work with each other, then even a very compelling virus of the mind comes. It only affects one small fraction of the population, and the other people can still look at very different angles and to kind of modify the virus into something that is useful for the society. On the other hand, if you in insist on a very homogeneous society that everybody is indoctrinated to think exactly the same way, even though it may be seeming efficient or linear kind of fashion, they are much more susceptible to a new idea that just paralyze the society or just take the society to a very dangerous turn. So ideas like fascism and communism and maybe dogmatic religious ideas, those are the examples you would refer to? Or, or social media, I mean. <laughs> Basically, you, you just mentioned uh, on social media, it's very easy for people to spread the ideas they like without fully understanding the repercussions. I think Taiwan benefits from a very diverse society, so that although geographically we're pretty together, people were able to kind of openly look at the different angles of any new idea that comes to Taiwan, instead of you know people just blindly following and spreading. But you personally then, uh, whenever I talk to people mm. uh, about China and mm. uh, their ambitions, mm. um, yeah, I think everyone has said that, mm. yes, there is a world. Mm. Yes, I am worried, or mm. some are even scared. Mm. Uh, most are, you know, contacting their daily lives and they're happy with that and they don't think things will change uh, now or mm. next week or rapidly, mm. but there is a worry. Mm. What do you say? I think it is, uh, of course, a, a fact that people here are worried uh, that PRC um, will, for example, develop uh, into a completely different track that may be irreconcilable uh, with the, the kind of democracy that we're working on. But on the other hand, I personally don't have that worry. Uh, I think what we're focusing on now has a much more universal appeal. And also the PRC, I think, even within the, the CCP, even within the Communist uh, Party in the PRC, there is also people working on uh, rule of law, working on accountability, working on corruption prevention under the umbrella, of course, of the CCP. And so, yeah, I, I think I'm still pretty optimistic. I think they're at the stage uh, where they really have to think very carefully about what kind of a governance model is sustainable uh, in the long run. And I think there are very few sustainable models that can kind of withstand the rapid emergent technology change. And so I do think, although fascism or authoritarianism uh, has a kind of temporary um, allure, um, democracy and diversity is going to win out in the end. But in the open democratic society, you have lots of minds thinking for themselves, uh, for their society, their, their country, looking at these problems from different levels. But in an authoritarian society, it seems as there are very few people, mm -hmm. well, everybody could be thinking, but very few people 
has the voice. Has the voice and can make the decisions. That's right. So it seems as if even if people are thinking mm -hmm. on the other side of the street, it may not result in anything. Mm -hmm. Or, or it, it may. I mean, one, one thing of the internet the technology is that it is designed uh, to survive censorship. It is designed to survive, um, you know, even a large-scale war, right? That is what internet was, was designed for. And so we see a lot of people, and I'm not just focusing on, on the PRC, uh, everywhere in Asia, and there is a repressive, repressive society or when um, the state, you know, cordons of the connection to social media overseas or things like that, we still see people cre creatively using internet technologies. They may have the best, um, you know, minds working on those internal communication methods that allows whistleblowers, allows uh, people with kind of human right to still communicate safely among themselves. Although it may be very difficult to communicate outside, uh, there is still a lot of liberating potential on the internet protocol for people to communicate among themselves. Do you said internet is democracy? Well, internet itself is based on the idea of voluntary association, right? People following a protocol discover each other. They can innovate uh, without permission even. So I, I wouldn't say it's democracy. It's actually ad hocacy, uh, like people who ad hoc uh, in a way that discover each other and want to work on something. The internet provides a neutral platform for people to collaborate in exactly such manner without people in the middle uh, having any say or control over uh, the communication. Of course, that's the in original ideal of the internet. Nowadays, uh, when people voluntarily go to the same website, of course, that gives that website owner a lot of control. But on the other hand, we're also uh, seeing a new generation of what we call the decentralized web the interplanetary file system people, the uh, Scuttlebutt, and there's many other e-web, uh, decentralized web innovators at the moment are working on a way that basically frees people from any central website or controlling point. Of course, the, the rising kind of star of that, uh, the distributed web, is what we call distributed ledger technologies or blockchain, right? But uh, there are many other non-blockchain technologies as well that builds on this kind of distributed trust. Okay, you're saying you're, you're pretty optimistic, but at the same time we see this polarized world, well, the polarization seems to be growing, and uh, in Europe and also in the States, we see this nationalistic movement, populist sometimes mm -hmm. called nationalist, and at its worst, mm -hmm. it's more or less fascist views. Uh, taking less, but yes, yeah, some less. less. <laughs> but nationalistic, populistic, <laughs> definitely, yeah. and it's sort of, yeah, the gap mm -hmm. is widening mm -hmm. between the sort of ideas of liberal democracy mm -hmm. and and you're not worried about that? No, I, I think it really is just a, a short-term um, symptom of people um, working with, say, mobile phones, working with a small screen that doesn't allow a carefully balanced conversation of seeing people through the proxy of short videos instead of through deep listening to one another and so on. I think this is a collective reaction of a new form of media that people still don't have quite the grasp of the limitations and, and the expectation to it. So I think it is really a literacy issue. And we, we see very similar things when, when TV first came about, when advertisement over TV first came about, when, when radio first came about. There's also you know a, a lot of period of panic and worry about like through radio, people can mind control the entire population and start world wars, right? Uh, so, so every new media has it's, I think, the first generation of people pioneering the use, but also abuse. But I think uh, over time, we start to learn the boundaries and limits and the best practice, or at least better practices, of using these new media. And we see this rapidly um, happening, I think, uh, in the media circles, in the people uh, now seeing the limitation of social media, and even in device and operating system makers, they're now putting a lot more emphasis on uh, privacy thanks to GDPR and, and friends, and also our responsible use of people's time and their attention. And so, yeah, I think many of my designer uh, friends, they, uh, they were just in Copenhagen uh, doing this uh, Copenhagen catalog that charters kind of a democratic oath of designers uh, and coders uh, who are making technologies in a way that is responsible and sustainable uh, for the humanity and not just for paying users or addictive users.
think we're done. Just if there's anything you would like to add mm -hmm. to this conversation that you think mm -hmm. I've forgotten to ask you about, or that you would like to just add for my knowledge. Mm. Well, I'll just read a prayer. <laughs> um, so, two years ago, when I first became the digital minister, um, I said I had a compact right now, the contract. And then they still ask me uh, a job description. So I just wrote a small poem as my job description, uh, which I'm going to read to you now. Um, so it goes like this. When we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was nice. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hur mycket av de här inkarna finns det med? Inte mycket, jag fick bara på att gå bra. Så kanske om vi sitter lite grann med att ta... Då, då får du sätta på det där. Ja, vi ska gå på det där igen. Men vi får ta dem bara bort från andra platser. Ja. Så vi kan kanske... Just run through the, uh, the slides here. Ja, yeah, of course. Yeah, we should do the, the poem also. That's nice. That's good. So, like, let me know when that comes starts. Okay. Yep. When we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. All right, uh, and so this is the Homemakers Union. The Children Arts Foundation. Be, 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 be. That is the the two uh, largest and oldest uh, social enterprises uh, in Taiwan. I was just talking about. It's just their logo. Yeah. Uh, and when I talk about the uh, the focus conversation method or the objective, reflective, interpretive, and decisional, uh, I talk about the facts, the feelings about the facts the ideas that takes care of the feelings and the decisions that reflect those ideas. And that and could be like the legislation. And it could be the regulation of legislation. And yeah. finally, this is my office. That's your yeah. office. Where is that? It's in the, near the Jingbo Flower Market. It's in Central Park. Uh, the Daitan uh, Forest Park is in the Central Taipei. Uh, and just nearby it, there's a Jingbo Flower Market. And we're just in the corner. Uh, you can go through it on the other side of Jingle Flower Market. It's just called Social Innovation Lab. So I can go. We could go there tomorrow. Yeah, it, it opens, opens every day from seven until eleven p.m. Okay. Could you write it down? Sure. 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 Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, and and many a time um, there's like. Like, like if you came a few months before, you see those self-driving tricycles there. So it's a very popular place for a lot of the experiments. Nice. All right, so we're good? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
直接写中文让司机带上去用。Are you going home now? Or? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. My, my home is just like seven minutes walk to that office. Okay. So usually I prefer just to walk to the office and back. Yeah, but this place is better for filming. Yeah. So where and when are you going to put that? Up? Usually we do it after you do. So it could be like an embargo, and you can set a time. Okay. But we can also upload it to YouTube as a kind of unlisted video, okay. meaning that we don't publish it. Okay. So you can use it as footage if That'd you want. Good. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, so we can. Why not? 对，我我现在就把它合上就好。哦、oh, ，OK。Yeah. 好。